Welcome, everybody. It is so good to have you here. This is a event that I look forward to every single year, and you are in for a special treat today. My name is Brian Kite. I am the interim dean of the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, and we have panelists and guests joining from around the world today. I thought to say good afternoon, but that certainly won't apply, although it is afternoon here in Hollywood. And we are uh, buzzing with an exciting weekend because, of course, it is Oscar weekend. So our host and moderator today is a costume designer, historian, and endowed chair at UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. She's the founding director of the David C. Copley Center for Costume Design. Her incredible career includes the classic Animal House, Blues Brothers, An American Werewolf in London, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Trading Places, The Three Amigos, Coming to America, for which she was nominated for an Academy Award, and the groundbreaking music video, Michael Jackson's Thriller. So, so just to be clear, uh, I think I just said that Deborah Landis is responsible for Indiana Jones's hat and Michael Jackson's Thriller jacket. She's a two-term past president of the Costume Designers Guild and past governor of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. She's the author of six books, uh, which uh, and she is the editor in chief of the upcoming three volume Bloomberry Encyclopedia of Film and Television Costume Design. Please welcome our moderator, my friend, colleague, and my design hero, UCLA distinguished professor, Deborah Nadulman Landis. Deborah. Thank you so much, Brian. I wish my mother was alive to hear that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming to join us today for the 11th annual Sketch to Screen panel. During today's one hour conversation, we're going to explore a little bit the costume designers inspiration and the process of bringing the, the people in the cinematic stories to life. To ask our costume designers a question please use the Q&A button to submit. And we will attempt to ask all the submitted questions as our hour allows. Also, at the conclusion of this panel and right now in the chat, you can find more information about the David C. Copley Center for Costume Design and a recording of the Sketch to Screen 2021 will be uploaded to the UCLA YouTube page. Next year, Sketch to Screen will be virtual and live. So please join us on our beautiful UCLA campus next year. Costume designers are actively engaged in achieving our well-deserved wage equity. And for more information, please go to page equity at cdgia.com naked hashtag naked without us you can find this also in your chat and before i introduce our panel i have to thank the people who make this panel possible every year including our long sponsorship and partnership with swarovski our producer crystal santana my longtime film editor john solomon copley center research director natasha rubin and my best student, interim dean, Brian Kite. So I am going to now introduce our panelists. Today, costume designer of Ma Rainey's Black Bo Bottom, the great Anne Roth, who's gonna be 90 years old in October, could not make it but Anne sends her love and congratulations to all of, all of you, all of her co-nominees. And we hope she continues designing long through her centennial year. I think for background, I'm going to share with the audience some of the range and versatility of the costume designers participating today. We also have an international panel, a panel. So from London, the nominated costume designer for Emma, Alexandra Byrne, 
won an Oscar for Elizabeth the Golden Age. But I, I want the audience to also know, in, in addition to being a virtuoso designer of period films, let's just say she is a virtuoso because, because Alex also designed Thor and the Avengers. And I hope we get to talk about that today. From Berlin, the nominated costume designer of Mulan is Bina Dagler. And Bina last year designed Mrs. America starring Kate Blanchett, which you can watch on Hulu. But Bina spent an early part of her career designing films like Volver for uh, Pedro Almodovar in Spain. And this year, Bina is our 2021 UCLA costume designer in residence and will be working with our students in May from Berlin. From Rome, the nominated costume designer of Pinocchio is Massimo Quintini Perini. And he's received many awards for, for his science fiction film, Ricardo Va, I'm not gonna pronounce this correctly, Massimo, Ricardo Va al Inferno and the contemporary film Dog Man. And from here in Los Angeles, the, the nominated costume designer for Mank is Trish, Trish Somerville. And I mean, the range is just amazing. She's also designed Hunger Games, Catching Fire and The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. So when we pose questions, we're not talking about simply the movie that the, each of these distinguished designers is, is nominated for, but in fact, these designers are distinguished in every part of their career. So in front of me, I have a lot of the questions that were already asked by, by, our, by everyone who registered. However, designers, I have a first question for you myself. Are you ready? All of you have done a lot of promotion for your nominated films. Do any of you have a question that has not been asked of you? Do any of you have, have any of you had an interview where you have said to yourself, I wish they would have asked me that. Is there something that you haven't been asked? And that's my question. Anybody? Yes, Massimo. Sì, non hanno mai chiesto quanto è duro il nostro lavoro. And Marina. Mar Marina, Marina is our translator. Yes, Massimo has never been asked how hard this job is. <laughs> <laughs> how hard is this job, Massimo? Quanto Beh, è duro? È un lavoro... È un lavoro durissimo perché comunque non è fatto solo di eh, frivolezza, ma è la, la base di tutto è la cultura visiva. E per far bene questo lavoro la conoscenza è la cosa più importante, perché stravolgere la conoscenza attraverso il nostro, attraverso il nostro lavoro è la cosa ancora più importante. Quindi solo con lo studio della storia del costume si riesce a, a, a farlo bene e a riuscire a... A, appunto a stravolgere la conoscenza stessa. Well, it is uh, very hard, Massimo has replied, uh, because uh, our job is not uh, frivolity at all. It has uh, to do with uh, achieving uh, a lot of uh, high-ranged visual culture so as to approach our subject matter. And you are only able to uh, approach knowledge and uh, overcome the knowledge that is the status quo by understanding it and deeply knowing it. And that is how you can set new knowledge for your craft. It's, it's a funny thing, Massimo, and I hope that <clears throat> Marina will, um, will translate this to you. Um, I've always thought that too much is made of movies being a visual art form, because in fact, for all of us, 
movies are also maybe first and foremost, a literary art form. Alex and Trish and Bina and you and Anne have to read the screenplay first and have to and have to read it and analyze it and then have a discussion with your director. And that's the first thing that happens. And then the research happens and then everything else falls into place or doesn't. But first we're, we're readers of text. And I often think that the general public doesn't understand that. And maybe, maybe that's what I was getting to when I was talking about Alex working on oh, designing Emma and designing Elizabeth the Golden Age and then equally going on to Thor and, and Avengers because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter. It comes in and then the creative process starts. Alex, what do you think about that? I mean, I think um, your question surprised me, Deborah, actually, and I had to think about it because a lot of the interview questions were asked just follow one track. So it all becomes a bit kind of repetitive. But the, the, the thing that I think is never discussed enough is that the initial part of our job is actually yes, we read the script and it's all words. It is how do you translate, what is the process of translating words into visuals? Mm -hmm. Because part of that journey is, you know, your director might be saying red and it's only, you know, this is a very uh, crude example, but it might be four weeks down the line that you discover your director is actually colorblind. <laughs> you know, but that can, that, that can happen and that, that has happened. Um, so it's about, you know, how do you, how do you go from the words and the script is the story. And on Emma, obviously I had the novel. So there's a lot of words and there are a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions, but somewhere those words have to translate into visuals in order to create your world and to create a coherent world with other departments. And I think that's part of the process that isn't talked about. Um, Alex, could you please put in the private chat the name of the director who is colorblind in case um, any of these designers need to work with that director, they have a tip. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare. What do you think about that, Trish? I mean, how do you go from the, how do you go from the text and to visualize whether it's Hunger Games, or, uh, Catching Fire or Mank? Those are two, they seem to be on the surface two completely different films. They are, I, I mean, I do think it's the thing of when I try and choose a project, I choose it for the script. Um, I don't choose it for the costumes. And then, and I've said this in the past, it's I choose the, the script and, and hopefully the director. And then I hope then the next bonus is there's something interesting for me to do in costumes because I am drawn towards story and conveying that story. And I, you know, the, with, with the process that I go for, it's, um, it's breaking down the script early on and then doing lots and lots of research. I think a lot of our jobs is, is so much research, whether it's real characters that you're looking at, people that really did exist, or it's fantasy or sci-fi. Um, you know, it's just the amount of research you do. And then the thing that I think that's beautiful about our jobs is we all read something differently and take from it and, and it's imagination. And that's what I love about what I do is what I read on the page can translate totally different than someone else reads on the page. And so I love, I know a script is good if I'm reading it and I can start seeing all these characters and the sets in my head. And I think the thing people don't really realize about what we all do is, you know, it, it's, it's a community of artists that come together. I work really, really closely with the production designer aside from working with the director and with the DP. And as an example for something like Mank where we had to figure out how to translate clothing from color into black and white, because we were shooting black and white, not, not flipping the film, was working really close with, with the director and the DP to figure out what exactly that would look like. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just think it's, um, you know, we all kind of look at things differently, like you're saying, you know, Alex says with red, and then the director doesn't even really know what that red is. It's just everybody's perception and trying to bring that imagination in your head and then exhibiting it on the screen. And, and what is beautiful also is this idea that it's, it's not a competition because if you took Mank and Bina was to design it or if Massimo was to design Mank or Alex was to design Mank or if I was to design Mank, we'd all bring something else to that, to that screenplay. 
Yeah. Bina, what what do you think about what do you think about the interpretation of the text? And and really, let me add something to that. So, I understand that you you had a female director on Mulan. On Mulan, had you ever worked with a female director before? Yes, I worked often with female directors and on like the biggest one was actually with on Zookeeper's Wife again with oh, wow. me. We had an exceptional big female crew. And I think the interesting thing by Mulan was that also the first AD was female and the DOP was also wow. Mandy Walker. So we were an extreme powerful female crew and it was really like also in the production meetings it was nearly equal um, between our men and, and women crew and um, it was interesting like to be guided by a person like Nikki um, and, and with her first AD, um, there was another energy for me. We had like a faster access to, um, and I really, really enjoyed it. So, so what you, oh, is it, you felt a difference in the balance of power because there were so many women? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yes, and there was like a different kind of energy. I mean, it's, it's normal now, like, we women work differently together and react differently than than men and i think both sides have just um it's it's complementary and it's greater if there is like a balance between both and i worked often 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 really on only male crews i mean i remember when i traveled around the world with oliver stone it was only me and all the others were men and, right. and this time with, with Nikki around the world, it was not at all like that. I, I had to bring it up because you and Alex, both Alex worked with, um, it was Anna Taylor-Joy. And, and what, uh, no, who was your Welcome director? Wild. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I, I noticed, look, it's pretty unusual out of the four of you to work with female directors this year. Yeah. And we had a female first as well, so we, but we didn't have a female DOP. Um, yeah, I, I think I would have agreed totally with you, Bina, until the, um, perversely the project I'm working on at the moment, it's, uh, it's not a woman director, it's a male director, but we have a very, very international crew. And I think sometimes the mix of, of culture can actually break down some of the entrenched kind of lines that have have evolved over the years. And I have to say that um, the project I'm on at the moment is, is uh, very, very easy and very collaborative and very creative amongst the group of international men. <laughs> so <laughs> you never know. <laughs> and every job is different. I think that's, that's the thing that is so unique about what we do. Every, you know, it's like a, a film is like a kind of extraordinary recipe that comes together and you're not quite sure what you're cooking. And, and the chemistry and the, the balance of, of hierarchy and power and strength of voice and collaboration is, is just different every time. And part of the intrigue is working that out and where you sit within that and how you, how you kind of negotiate your or navigate achieve your artistic freedom I think well and to that point Alex uh, somebody once said to me that uh, because as Massimo said the job is so hard that costume designers are addicted to to a couple of things adrenaline getting it done just getting it done and the second thing to learning and as you said um, each job is so different, different yeah. and the same. They're all a different challenge. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because the film I did straight after Emma was the Mauritanian, and we ended up shooting in Mauritania, which is has no film infrastructure at all. You can't, there are no generators, no costume rails, no plastic bags, no hangers. Um, 
and it's a totally segregated society. Men can't, women can't touch men, first of all. You know, so that was, you know, brings its own challenges. Wow, and big budget and small budget. <laughs> yes. And, and hits and flops. And yeah. we never know what it's going to be. And we never know, do we? We never know. Never know. But we, but part of the, the nature of it is that you, you know, I'm sure I speak for all of us, you commit wholeheartedly. You don't know. But once you've committed, you know, you are, you are in it up to and beyond your neck. And, and I think there's also an interesting question of, I don't know whether anybody else has been in that position, but I've certainly, I can look back on projects and, and go, what is, when do we build in this thing that we don't just walk away? Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's too hard and too difficult that, that actually one should walk away, but that's a different conversation. Yeah, it's, a, conversa it's a conversation we leave for when the uh, general audience is not looking. That's the punishing part of the job, I suppose. Mm. Um, mm. There are a lot of questions about how, how costume designers dealt with the pandemic. Can I see a show of hands? Who's been working through this pandemic? All right. All right, everybody. Massimo, uh, I mean, I have questions from Eva, Laura, Stephanie, Holly, Abra, Barbara, Don, Marcy, Ann, and Deborah, and Jamika too, all about um, are you incorporating face masks into your costumes? Can you tell us what the challenges of lockdown has been? How has the industry adapted to the pandemic? Uh, how did you manage? What are the difficulties? Can you can you give us a rundown? Uh, uh, Bina, can you start and and just just let us let us in on what, what what happened to you this year? Well, I started in July, and we were supposed to um, to prep, and we are supposed to start to shoot in October. Then it got delayed, and we just keep prep prepping, but only like half half term like I did two weeks off two weeks work two weeks off something like that and um, then we had to delay again and so I have a very very long prep time and I finally start to shoot in a week and um, now the last week suddenly all the actors arrive but they uh, they arrive and they have to quarantine we all have to wear of course face masks i did um fittings per zoom because i have such an international cast and i find it really difficult because what trish for example said i also work i love to work in the crew i love to work near to the other hod's and we are not, to allow, not allowed to sit all together in a room. So we do everything by Zoom. And I just find it that it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same like that you just can drop by. I do a lot with intuition and, and I just, I feel like I can't work like free, like freestyle. I have a lot of rules and every day, like at least one hour, I lose to any kind of COVID problems. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really, really looking forward to a moment where the crew is vaccinated, but I think that takes a long time. Thank you for that. HRD head of department. Trish, what was it like for you this year? Well, I have to say in ways, I, you know, I have to be really grateful because the project I'm on, I mean, I joke, it's one of the few projects I've done where my entire family, including my nieces can view because it's, it's a very happy family, <laughs> family film. Um, but you know, I was I was working in Toronto, and I have to say, working with Netflix, we had a lot of guidelines, and I felt very safe. Um, our our you know um, our AD and the director kind of laid out a really great uh, one line, so our schedule, our plan of how we're shooting, and kind of put all the scenes with the background and extras towards the end in hopes that you know that things would smooth out because we started shooting. Um, we were supposed to start shooting in November and then we got pushed and we started shooting February. So we too are wearing the face mask. When we're on set, we wear a face shield. There's different zones depending on who you're with. And, you know, as all of us, I'm sure I'm extremely hands-on. I, I dress all the background with my team. I do fabrics. I do everything. I'm in the breakdown room all the time. And it does make it quite hard because you have to have another level of 
being very courteous of how everyone else feels. I check in with my team and my crew all the time to make sure everybody's feeling safe physically and mentally. But yeah, it's definitely challenging. And, you know, we had, we had, you know, a smaller, a smaller cast of actors in the beginning, which really helped us kind of get our footing on how to be on set. We had two actors, three actors at a time, and then kind of built up. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely affected us all in different ways. I mean, fabric shopping is insane to do that virtually, <laughs> you know, I mean, people are holding things up or you get things in the mail and you have to make these decisions immediately because you're also taking into consideration what shipping is. I mean, there's so many levels of what we do of, you know, you can select fabrics and then you hope they come to you in time. As an example, we ordered these sweaters as a, a test sample. We ordered them in August. I got them two weeks ago before I left Toronto, you know, so, and we're done shooting in May. So yeah, it's, it's definitely presenting a lot of challenges. And Alex, Alex, uh, you look like you're... <laughs> <laughs> on your hand. What was your I hate, I have to say, I just hate shooting, working under COVID protocol because it takes out, it takes out the serendipity, the collaboration, the laughter, everything is so procedural. And yes, you know, we're all very experienced. We make it work, but ultimately at a cost, it is compromised. You know, you can't get the fabrics. You can't get the thing you want. You can't get the actors for fittings. You're going to have, you know, one fitting. So you have to, maybe you have to slightly turn it down. You don't have the conversations. You don't do the fittings where it just happens in a fitting room. And then you follow up two weeks later with what you want. You've got a week when they're out of quarantine to get the actors on set. So sure, nobody goes on naked, but it's not, it's it's hard work. It's really, I, a friend of mine said, what's it like? And I said, it's like being put on a diet of dry biscuits day after day <laughs> after day. The kind of the fun and the, you know, the, the just the warmth of the process. And, it, you know, we, like most of I said, we, we all work really, really hard, but it is a team collaboration and it's a family and, you work with people and that's been that's been stripped very thin. I think that's very, very well said. And all of the, I talked about the head and the pursuit of the, the intellectual part of costume design, but there's so much hands and just getting a shoulder seam right and being in a fitting room and touching, we're always touching everything. And the feel of the fabric, all of that, of course, is gone. Massimo, what was your experience this year? Eh, la mia esperienza quest'anno è stata un po' difficile perché durante la seconda ondata in Italia io stavo facendo il film eh, Tirano di Joe Wright. E eravamo in Sicilia. La Sicilia è stata abbastanza eh, non colpita dal Covid, però il problema è stato eh, tutti i fornitori, gli ordini delle stoffe, eh, tutti i bottoni, eh, le fabbriche erano chiuse, ho avuto moltissimi problemi a reperire il materiale che mi serviva per fare i costumi che sono stati fatti tutti, tutti nuovi, avevo pochissimo tempo di preparazione e la difficoltà maggiore per me è stata che in, in Italia non era possibile provare lo stesso costume ad una comparsa e poi se non gli entrava metterla alla, ad un'altra comparsa perché bisognava prima sanificarlo e quindi ho dovuto fare il doppio delle cose per potermi aiutare in questo senso e poter avere una possibilità in più. Però sono stati veramente tutti molto attenti sul set, eh, abbiamo fatto il tampone tutti i giorni da luglio a dicembre e mi è venuto un naso larghissimo praticamente, però grazie a Dio ci sono stati dei casi di Covid ma niente, niente di grave sul set. So yes, uh, as my colleagues have said, it has been a very, very difficult year for me too. I have, uh, I have been working on uh, Joe Wright's uh, movie, Cyrano, and we were shooting in Sicily and it was exactly during the second wave of COVID in Italy. Luckily, uh, Sicily had been slightly spared vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of Italy, but still we had uh, many, many problems in receiving our supplies. Uh, for example, the factories 
factories were closed, uh, so we could not receive uh, the buttons of uh, the fabrics. Uh, and that, of course, meant that we had uh, a lot of uh, work to do very, very rapidly. Uh, we have uh, designed and made the costumes uh, from scratch. And uh, uh, the biggest problems we problem we encountered was that uh, if we had a fitting with an actor or an extra, if it did not fit the extra, we could not have another person try it on. If it was too small or too big, it had to be sanitized. So of course, this meant that we had to uh, work twofold. What we could do normally once uh, required, you know, uh, to be done twice. Nonetheless, uh, we have worked in a very safe environment. We've been very, very careful in all of the operations and we took swabs every single day. So my nose uh, has become pretty big because uh, we've had uh, swabs taken from October through December. Uh, some COVID cases, but luckily nothing very, which was serious. Uh, but Massimo, did you eat very well in Sicily? Of course I did. <laughs> Absolutely. It's an amazing place for food. All right. So no fat, <laughs> but you ate very well. That's why I'm big now. Yeah. Well, we all have a COVID. We all have a picture in COVID. Listen, uh, Massimo, I do have a question for you and, and that many people have asked from the audience as well about, about aging and what was especially beautiful in Pinocchio was the texture of the whole frame, but especially the costumes. And in costume design, we call it uh, distressing, aging, and dying, which sounds hilarious if you kind of say it that way. Can you talk a little bit about how important it is to distress, age, and dye your clothes before they go on screen? È importantissimo. Uh, in Pinocchio abbiamo fatto 60, più di 60 abiti nuovi per gli attori e i piccoli ruoli ed è stato difficilissimo da nuovi ridurli in, in povertà, in brandelli. Tutti i personaggi del film sono personaggi che arrivano da un mondo molto povero, con abiti eh, usati, con abiti raccattati in giro. E il lavoro dell'invecchiamento è stato veramente molto difficile, molto lungo perché soprattutto doveva sembrare reale, cioè tutto doveva essere tangibile. Pinocchio doveva essere, ehm, è un progetto eh, con un'ispirazione che viene dalla realtà, dalla povertà vera dell'Ottocento. Ed è stato un lavoro veramente molto difficile, abbiamo usato delle tecniche anche un po' inusuali, perché abbiamo usato una betoniera che normalmente viene usata per il cemento, per poter far rotolare i costumi eh, in modo continuato per ore, abbiamo usato le fiamme, abbiamo usato le rocce per grattarli e poi c'è stato un lungo lavoro di comunque di, 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 di eh, toppe, rammendi, svarichinature, eh, non ci siamo mai 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 fermati, eh, però sono felicissimo del risultato perché in molti mi chiedono se sono abiti realmente antichi che, che io ho trovato in giro e invece no, sono stati tutti fatti nuovi e poi invecchiati. Well, of course, uh, this uh, job requires all these procedures and it is very, very important to carry them out carefully. For Pinocchio, for example, we had to make uh, more than 60 costumes uh, uh, new, newly made from scratch, I mean, for all of the actors, also for the minor roles. And then we had to make them look aged. And so we had to uh, have them look as tattered as possible because these characters were all living in a very poor world. This is exactly the background that characterizes the movie Pinocchio because it is set in an era of great poverty of the 19th century. So we had to carry out the aging procedures and that took a very long time. It was a very difficult procedure because everything had to look very real, very tangibly real and poor. And and so we used uh, different uh, procedures, which are quite uh, bizarre for uh, this department, i.e. some of the costumes were put in a beton machine so that the costumes could be rolled inside it uh, so that they could uh, uh, 
be as aged as possible. Some of them were treated with flames and fire to again achieve uh, that uh, idea of aging. Then we had to uh, put patches on uh, the costumes. We had to carry out a lot of uh, darning and dyeing, of course. But I'm very, very happy with the result because many people asked us whether we uh, used costumes that were antiques that we had found uh, old costumes and used. Uh, and that is a really high compliment, right? <laughs> Trish, Trish, you talked about being in the dye room or in aging. How important is aging, distressing aging and dying to you? It's extremely important. Um, I mean, my favorite places to be at work are the workroom and the dye room and the breakdown room. Um, even when it's something subtle, I think it's so important. And, you know, um, that's the thing saying where Alex brought up about it's all about a team and your crew. And it really is to have that conversation and have that same view, you know, with your team and your crew about how you visually want things to look and how you want them to feel and how you want them to read on screen. So, you know, in, in the in Mank, I don't have tons of breakdown um, on the lead character except, except for like Gary's character, who that was really important to me to have his suits be very just lived in, but in a realistic way of him being lived in because it wasn't to be tattered and, and broken down to the point where there's holes, but that just he's had the same suits for many years and kind of go with, you know, is the sweat of his alcoholism and his, his weight gain. But I do think for me, I, I feel, you know, the breakdown and aging and dying of, of our garments and our costumes that we make, it's also the thing that really brings, you know, very personal life to them. So I, that's one of my favorite processes after designing and fabrications is, is figuring out all the little subtle touches, even if it's, you know, people don't even think about it. at times we repaint buttons. I have such a big thing about buttons on garments and how I either want them to stand out or to blend in. And, you know, it's repainting shoes. We all know those things of like, you know, just getting the color and the tone exactly right, getting the, the wear on the toe or the back of the heel right, whether it's for me visually to see it or for it's the actor to have that character development in it, that it's something that they feel they connect with it. But I think it's very, very important to what we do. Right, and, and no one sees it. It's really for, for us. But the audience is affected by that kind of care, I believe. The feeling I also, I would say that I, I'm sure um, people wouldn't think that the costumes through Emma went through breakdown, but every every piece of costume went through breakdown because it's it's what changes. And again, most of Emma was made, but that's what moves it from being costume to clothes. The process of whether it, however subtle it is, just the the kind of the spraying in or the the painting or whatever you're doing to just make it all bed in so that it becomes clothing um, as opposed to costume that's come out from under a sewing machine. And Alex, does that mean that you wash the fabrics first? Can you take us through that? Oh yeah, well, yeah, you wash them because of shrinkage. But in fact, on Emma, the, the fabrics were very simple and because the color was so important, we we created nearly all those fabrics. They're all dyed or printed or created in our in our textile workshop because we couldn't, um, Autumn wanted such a specific use of color working again with the production designer that we had to make our own fabrics. What was, what was the color palette for Emma? <sighs> Everything. <laughs> <laughs> no. it was, uh, for Emma herself, it was a seasonal palette that Autumn and I worked out because it goes through a calendar year. And then, and then the colors came, were always in relation to Emma, but, but Autumn talked about it being kind of sugared macaroons and mm -hmm. um, anybody who knows my work will know that pastels are not, it's not my comfort zone at all. So it was quite challenging. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a question that I would love to direct to you and then, and then to Bina about, many people asked about uh, authenticity and 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 it it's always uh, amused me and frustrated me that uh, the general public and critics also talk about costumes as being great when they're authentic, 
Now, we, we know that that doesn't mean anything. Can you explain a little bit um, how, how much you hew to the period itself, exactly the period to itself, and how much you have license to use your imagination? Well, that's quite a big question. Uh, we're, number one, we're storytellers. And I think our, our purpose is to help the director tell the story they want to tell. Um, if it's a period for, no, period, contemporary, whatever, the research is crucial because you need to understand the period that the story is set in to be able to consciously and hopefully intelligently make decisions where, the, where you veer away from period or where the, you know, to know what you're doing, to be in control of the decisions you're making. Um, and, you know, that I think a good example of it is that, that so many people think both Elizabeth and Elizabeth the Golden Age are accurate to period. They are 100% not accurate to period. Even the corset shape is different. And I've seen Elizabethan films after those where I, I took the ruff off the wrist and did an extended um, cuff on a sort of a cow hoof cuff. And on so many Elizabethan films, I've seen cow hoof cuffs and you think, oh, has that gone down in legend now? Is that now authentic? I don't know, you know, but <laughs> no, you, it, and bodies are different. Proportions of bodies are different. So, you, you know, you, you need to know the period to interpret it. And it is only ever seen from our point of view today. You know, a 40s film about Elizabeth looks like a 40s film about Elizabeth. And we are only working in the context of the world we live in. Yes, uh, uh, Trish, remember that I want to ask you that question in a minute. Mm -hmm. Bina, talking about Mulan and authenticity, how much research did you do about Chinese costumes? And I have a question from, uh, from an audience member, Cheng Hui, who asked, how did you balance creativity, authenticity, and historical accuracy when you designed Mulan? What was your preparation for Mulan? And where did you make the clothes? So of course I started with uh, intense and deep research, but from the beginning, it's clear that I'm working for Disney and I did a fantasy mo movie that was like clear for me. But I started with the research and I traveled to, through China and I visited the, the museums and I visited the costume houses there and I had Chinese assistant and um, but for me it's like when you have a good recipe you read the recipe and at the end you make it your own and you use your own ingredients and and that is what I did because for me the spirit of the movie came through our script it's again the reading the words and um, the visual language that our director wanted to express and um, and also like the audience we wanted to reach. And so once I did all this research that was really amazing. I mean, I was in, in China, I was in museums. They were so, so rich and they were so colorful and, and so amazing. I, I took this as a base and then I felt completely um, libre, um, I, f I felt completely free to do whatever my fantasy brought and my intuition said that this is like the right thing for our Mulan. And that for example, she is dressed in red for me was super important because I knew then this is for me my warrior Disney character and not a princess. And, and I think that was really the important part much more than now a historical accurate um, costume making and where I made the costume. So I had a, as we were shooting um, and preparing in New Zealand, my workroom was set up in New Zealand mm -hmm. and I had another workroom in, in China and um, a little bit around the world because it was so huge. We did so many costumes. How many, and how many costumes for Mulan? I did all the imperial city, everything by from scratch. It, wow. so I had like, I think nine months of prep and we just did endless, endless. Mm -hmm. And then of course, all the armor was made by um, Veta and, and they have also such a big team 
Um, but it was really fantastic to get all these these fabrics and just be um, feel free to do whatever we wanted. It was it was really great. Thank you. We have about five more minutes now, Trish. There are so many questions about designing for black and white hmm. because you're the uh, I mean you're the single uh, black and white nominee. So I've got. I've got so many, Maggie, Louise, Dustin, Dawn, Catherine, Philip. It's uh, how did you test for black and white? How did you know, uh, you, you, I, I would like to think that you did not make those costumes in black and white. You made them in color, just mm -hmm. like in, in the golden age of Hollywood. Uh, how did you approach black and white for men? Um, in the beginning, before we kind of had any sort of camera test, I used, um, there's three settings in, in my phone that I could use that were different ranges of black and white tones. So I went to different rental houses and photographed um, from solid colors to patterns, and then did the same with fabrics, you know, of every kind of color and fabric, and then looked at through them through the three different settings, sent them to David Fincher and Eric Messerschmidt, who was our DP, and said, I know this is not gonna be accurately exactly how we shoot, but could you give me a base of which one of these three is closest to where we're gonna go? And it was in the noir setting and a tungsten uh, light, but we went with noir. And so my assistant, Corey uh, Dice and I kind of proceeded to do everything that way. And we kind of shared our information with the rest of production of, you know, this is how we're shooting things. We talked to hair and makeup about it as well and literally looked at everything that way. And it's what made me realize like, oh, now I know why Edith Head had these glasses that diffuse lighting and saw things tonally. And what we realized was what colors read really well. And as kind of as Alex has said, I'm not, I mean, you know, Catching Fire has a lot of color in it because it was that story. But personally, I was thrilled to do black and white because, you know, I feel to help tell the story, you need what you need. But you know, I'm not big on a lot of color. Um, Fincher is definitely not big on color. And so it was figuring out what we could do tonally per scene to, to contain the colors that also weren't jarring to your eye, didn't take the actors out of their character, but then was visually really beautiful on the screen. And, you know, we use very little black, even at the funeral scenes, it's browns and navies and aubergine and, you know, and Bordeaux's. Um, and you realize like how much black really sucks up the light and how much white really pops. So it was really finding tones and not just thinking in black and white, but finding a scale of tones that we could use that would show every gray in between that helped us kind of balance in the room. Did it make you more appreciative of Adrian and Travis Panton and Ori Kelly and the designers of the well, I think, I mean, it definitely did. I, I definitely watched a lot of black and white films and then did a lot of research on fabrics and what colors were really popular of the time. And, you know, for me, I mean, I, I coral is a color, or turquoise is a color I have a really hard time using. Um, and those colors present themselves as de chartreuse beautifully in black and white, but I knew it was something I couldn't have literally be on set those colors. And then in an odd way, it helped me with the film I'm doing now really appreciate color because it's a more playful film. So I, I'm able to use color there. So I, I learned a lot through the process and it's, it is interesting how you, it challenges your brain in a different way where we could even just look at something in black and white or I'd send a photo to my assistant and be like, what color is this? And he's like, baby blue. You know, we just started knowing what the colors were because you just shifted your head in that way and knowing like, how contained we had to be with prints and textures because prints and patterns became very confettied on, on screen and just doing that very tonally. There was an article in the early 30s in a newspaper and the, the, the heading was in Hollywood where brides wear red and, and we know where widows wear red and brides wear pink. Mm. because red photographed black and pink photographed white. And, and back to Alex mentioning about a director being colorblind, pink comes up to someone colorblind as white. Mm. So a lot of times that's how they'll see that. And again, like you're saying with the red, it will look, it will look black, it will look really saturated. So yeah, it's an interesting process, which I really enjoyed. It was really quite fun. 
No, I mean, costume designers are, are, are students. I mean, we're always learning on the job. We'll get, it's like gardening. Nobody ever knows, no gardener ever knows everything. And no costume designer never knows everything because you always have new challenges. And we love that. Mm -hmm. So we're coming up to two minutes. Here's a lightning round. Are you ready? Who is or what film inspires you? What do you go back to? And let me start. Uh, I found Anthony Powell a great love and inspiration, himself and his work. Bina, who inspires you? What costume designer inspires you? Or what film inspired you? Well, it is actually Dangerous Liaisons is one of my favorite. So um, I think there was the moment where I really thought I would love to do this profession. So that's Jim Atchison, James Atchison. Trish, who do you love? Well, I mean, for me, that's a really hard question because I, you know, I love a lot of people's works. Um, I think Mary Queen of Scots was such a beautiful, beautiful film. Um, and very, very interesting costumes in the way those were brought about. But I think if I go back to my first thought, um, when I was young, it was the hunger for some reason. It was really this kind of romantic, magical, beautiful film for me, um, which is not typical, I think, for the costumes, but that, I think, the hunger. So the hunger, Milena Cananero mm -hmm. and, and then Mary Queen of Scots, uh, Alex Byrne. Alex, who Beautiful. inspires you? Thank you. Um, I would say the work Pierre Tozzi is the designer. I, I just love his range, his detail, his characters, you know, it's fabulous. And also so interesting seeing, as Trish was saying, so interesting to see some of the pieces in the Italian costume houses and, and going, wow, I would not have thought that was that dress, you know. Yes. Uh, Massimo, your, your mm -hmm. idol. My idol is Piero Tosi. <laughs> of course. It was my master. And one of my um, favorite movie is uh, Barry Lyndon. And that's that inspired me a lot. And that's Milena Cananero. Before we close, what's the one quality a costume designer must have? Oh, um, patience <laughs> and, and the ability to listen, to really listen. Bina. I think it varies a lot. Um, for me, it's intuition because often I have like to find the right things without having a lot of knowledge, I just have to have the intuition. Massimo, what's the quality, quality costume designer has to have? Uh, a deep patience for this job, really, really. For me, it's so important. And Alex, last word. Well, um, I would say being bipolar between <laughs> pragmatism and creativity <laughs> and ca caring and, and caring passionately and deeply about the work thank you all so much i wish you the best of luck i send you my love in london in berlin in rome i uh, give my love to everyone there trish thank you for being here too um, thank goodbye you. goodbye everyone check your chat and come see us next year. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Good luck, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye.